Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, this is an enormous honor to be able to address this group and to be able to take part in the Miller Colson Academy. Uh, I think you'll hear echoed frequently the words honor and humility. Uh, to be recognized by your peers is probably one of the most gratifying experiences that we can have. And to be able to work with this group of individuals who, having been here about 14, 15 years, I've already self-selected uh, as among the greatest clinicians. And to be allowed to be included in that group is really impressive to myself. Um, as a surgeon, we are often accused of seeing the world differently or perhaps behaving a little differently. And, and we're told many times that we do not do primary care. Well, I take a contrary opinion to that. Uh, I'm disappointed sometimes if I round in the hallways and I find patients who don't know who their doctor is. And they've seen many people. And I can assure you that every single one of my patients knows who I am because I've spent the time with them. Uh, and this doesn't begin in the operating room. It begins long beforehand. And each of the patients knows who I am, what I'm going to do, and I make the effort to connect with them. So by the time you've had preoperative visits, preoperative teaching, operation, course in the hospital, most of the patients realize I have three kids, that two of them play ice hockey. Now, if they've unfortunately had a complication and stayed a little longer, then they realize that I also coach ice hockey. <laughs> And showed up one day, my wife having checked the box that I could assist, and the fellow on the other side handed me an equipment bag and shook my hand and said, congratulations, coach, you're coaching baseball this year. <laughs> and sometimes you just have to be up for the task at the moment. Well, one of the issues in, in facing the, the challenge of providing medical care in this era where there's less and less time to spend with the patients is not just how to do it yourself, how to teach this to the next generation. How do I teach this to our surgical residents? I don't know if people realize the fabulous opportunity I have. I do two, four, six hour operations, one on one with a bright trainee. That's hours of time. Uh, I can spend plenty of time you know, dissecting out the left gastric artery. There's only so much I can say about that. So that this is the pulpit to wax eloquent on all those other aspects of care. I insist that the resident has seen and talked to the patient before the operation. You can walk into an operating room, patients asleep, they all look the same under drapes. Obviously, they're not all the same. And if you've spoken to someone and seen their eyes and met with their children, met with their parents, understand the, the, the drama, as it were, of the moment. I mean, often an operation, particular cancer operation, is a singular moment in someone's life and they're looking at your eyes when you go in, and they're looking at your eyes the minute you come out of the operating room. But all during that time, I had the opportunity to talk with the residents. Now, this is a teaching hospital, so that we dance around that point. Who does the operation? Is that the surgeon? Is that the resident? And I'm up front with the patients and point out that it's a shared experience. And my goal is to share the excellence and provide it not what I can do by myself, but what I can do with a senior or chief resident or an intern for that matter. And I also recognized if I were called on to do some fabulous operation at another institution, the patient would be much better served if I went with my chief resident than if I went with another attending surgeon. Because the two working together, knowing whose role is which, knowing how to communicate, and frankly, seven years of training into it, that's how a machine works well. Also, the resident, it's not just a technical issue. Yes, I have to teach techniques. Far more important, though, is teaching how to care for the patient, beginning at that first visit, beginning in the preoperative holding area, and following through afterwards. So when we walk out of that operation, the senior resident thinks, I did that operation. When I walk out of the same procedure, same set of facts, I think I did it because it becomes increasingly clear it's not who holds the scissors, who makes the cut. It's where the direction is to say, here's what to go, here's where we're going next, here's why we're doing it, and then reminding underneath all of this, oh yes, the culprit life stirs underneath there. This is somebody, this is a person with aspirations, goals, hopes for the future who wants to get back to doing that. So during that couple hours time I have, you know, that, that's when the stories come out, that's when the, we talk about the patients, we talk about the resident, their family, that's where I insist at you know, 10 at night when the pager goes off and it's the wife, husband, girlfriend, spouse, 
that someone answer that call. That's all the difference in the world. I mean, the, the number of, of dinners and evenings that we give up for this profession adds up. And for the spouse or anyone outside, it isn't so much missing the dinner, it's not knowing and waiting and waiting. One of Dr. Hellman's patients I had the opportunity to take care of several years ago commented, I must have cost you several dinners with your family. Well, one of the points is that, that we're available to our patients. As long as I'm in the United States, my pager is on. Uh, in the emergency department, I think they go through the EPR record, and if they can find my name anywhere on the chart, <laughs> call Dr. Duncan, the surgery resident will be down, you know, they'll take care of it right away. I, but it's that type of availability. That's where the, the patient knows you're the doc, where the consulting pulmonologist or the gastroenterologist knows you're the person that they're going to talk to. Increasingly, I've found it's less about modeling behavior but inculcating that, developing that, and pushing sets of behaviors. And I thought about this when we had symposia on professionalism. And you know, looking at some of the folk assembled here, looking at my colleagues, these are the group of people that you would like your trainees to develop and come into. But it takes more now than just saying, I'll be a role model, look at how I do it. I mean, especially in surgery, our biggest issue is perhaps we at Hopkins are too impressed with ourselves and need to spend more time thinking about how we're going to develop this in all the others. I sometimes carry with me on rounds a little measuring stick. And if one of our residents is very impressed with what they've done, I say, all right, let's, let's get this out and see really what we did. I mean, how tall are we with, with that last accomplishment? Uh, it, we need a little more humility in our day-to-day -day activity. So I, I'm increasingly convinced that it's the communication of these things. It, it's, it's how you interact with the residents, with the patients, with their families, <coughs> with colleagues, that, that's really the way to take it forward. The, the leadership in the old days was the single most clinically respected individual in the department became the chief. And, and at some point in the business, you needed an MBA or you needed administrators capable. But really now, I think more agree, it's about communication. It's about listening. It's about feedback. Uh, it's about taking your lieutenants and making them lieutenant generals. It's about bringing people up. And so those communicative skills are so important. Uh, I'll finish up by saying, you know, when we come out of the OR, I said that the, the family are looking at your eyes. So in a tumor operation, they want to know, is, he, is the patient cured? Is it good? And the happy speech is easy. The happy speech is everything went well. We got the tumor out, no sign of spread. Anyone can give that speech. It's a joy. I mean, boy, that's one of the happier things I get to do in life. Far more important is the unhappy speech, is the speech where we couldn't get it all out, where there's something left behind, where there was a problem, a difficulty. And then all of a sudden, everything comes into play. All of those pre-op visits, every interaction with the patient, uh, that's where the humanity comes in. And this is why I want to bring the residents in not just to model this, but to take part, to understand, to see how people are, are looking and looking for the hope. Because none of us cure everybody. Everyone's passing in the end. In a, in a simplistic way, the idea is not of my disease, not on my watch. But we're taking care of people. And the people are going to have other issues come up. So when you come out and have that discussion, if there's any issue, any problem, if it isn't the happy speech that everyone wants, that's when it's all the more important that you've had the time before connected with the patient. They know about when my kid got knocked on his hind side in the hockey game. And it's amazing how, uh, you know, I'll finish a 15-minute discussion, and I'm sorry, the tumor spread, we're going to be able to do this, you know, we're still with you, we're there all the way. And at the end, they say thank you, and by the way, how'd your son do in that game? And, and you realize that there are many different levels that we can connect with each other, and it's that connection that establishes the bond, that provides the trust, that lets us take care of the patients. Thank you very much.